Good afternoon, everybody. Tyree Gray here. Such a pleasure to be with you today. And I am personally super excited for the panel that we have today. Um, as we all know, March is Women's History Month. And, you know, as a proud uh, son of a, of a single mother who went on to advance her career and her degree while I was a young kid, um, and seeing how hard she worked in order to create in opportunities for me, uh, when we were thinking about what type of content we could bring to the group here in March, it was a no brainer that we should have a team of powerful, um, smart and creative women um, leaders here in our community to come in and uh, present to us today. And initially I wanted Dana to do the welcome. Uh, uh, all of us will remember Dana Bennett and, um, you know, but she's unfortunately not able to be here today because she's gonna be honored tomorrow by the Nevada's Women's Chamber down in Las Vegas. So I'm actually sitting in my car right now, despite the virtual background, because I wanted to get back to Las Vegas so that I could uh, actually celebrate Dana tomorrow at, the um, the luncheon, but with that, I we have asked for a phenomenal facilitator to help out today, uh, Miss Susan Clark, who has 35 years of experience in consulting and facilitating and supporting startup companies. And I was able to get a small sneak peek of some of the content that you guys are going to hear today. And trust me, you will not be disappointed. So um, to everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Again, the Nevada Mining Association is committed to being a leader, um, not just in the mining industry, but frankly, really in all thought areas and being able to provide content like this to you is really important. So with that, I'm actually going to log off and sign on as a visit as a attendee so that you guys will be able to focus on Susan and Catherine Raw and our special guest, uh, Emily uh, Jensen. And so again, thank you so much, everybody for tuning on and enjoy the conversation. Thanks again, Susan, for being uh, willing to moderate. Look forward to speaking and hearing all you guys have to say. Well, thank you, Tyree. I'm really pleased to introduce two great panelists today for our conversation. Catherine Ra, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Barrett Gold Corporation in North America, and Emily Jansen, the General Manager of the Reno Aces, which you all know is a AAA affiliate of the Major League Baseball team, the Arizona Diamondbacks. So it's so nice having both of you here today with us. Thank you. So, Thank you. Great. So panelists, I think we'll start with a question from Dana. She um, left us a question before she left on her trip. And she asks, as women who have steered their way through male dominated industries, we can all point to other women who mentored us directly or perhaps indirectly served as models for us. Certainly, she says, I think I, I can think of women who demonstrated how to manage one's way with dignity and grace, and also women who demonstrated what not to do. But I can also think of several men who had tremendous impact on my career over the years, and I suspect that you two have also benefited from some such relationships. So Dana asks, feel free to name names if you want, but I'm more interested in hearing about the qualities of these men who helped you along the way. What did they do or say that made a difference in your careers? Catherine, did you want to start with that one? Sure, and I think Dana makes a very good um, point there about, about male dominated industries, because actually I, I've never had a, uh, a woman boss. You know, from, from the moment I came into, first of all, it was financial services. So I worked for Merrill Lynch Investment Managers and then BlackRock, always within the mining space. Um, uh, all of my bosses were men. Uh, and what I did have were a couple of uh, female mentors that, that were working elsewhere in the organization. But, but my daily interactions were almost completely with uh, men. And then as I've come into the mining industry, that's been true too, where, where almost every interaction, um, uh, especially at the senior level is also with men. Um, but but to, to answer the question specifically, uh, I, I, I thought of three things really. The, the first was my first boss. The, the biggest thing, and particularly for a 22 year old, was that he actually talked to me. So, so what I mean by that, he was head of the team, 
you know, a, a reasonably large team. But but he chose, and I think it was because I was roughly the same age as his eldest daughter. Uh, he chose to actually give me advice, uh, to tell me his view of the world. He used to put his feet up on the desk and say, Catherine, what you need to know is, and I would get these lectures about what was going on in the market or what was going on in the papers or what the company we just met, what mining company, what were they doing? And it was wonderful for someone to engage with me at that level because because often bosses are too busy or um, they, they're they too focused on other things to take time for the new arrivals at, uh, at, at in the company. And that led me on to other uh, men I've interacted with, other, other senior men, where the amazing thing was um, watching how they behave to people that don't matter. And, and for a long time, I didn't matter. You know, you're lower down in the organization. And when they remember your name, when you watch them talk to people in the lift that they have met before or that they've picked up and remembered someone that really doesn't matter elsewhere in the organization, they've remembered the last conversation they had and picked up on it. it it's those little things about um, taking care to speak to people that ultimately won't impact your day in any way, but because you want to impact theirs. And keeping that and remembering that as I interact with people, as I walk into the office, I was down in Elko last week, being able to remember that actually just acknowledging someone and recognizing their achievement, it, it can make or break um, uh, someone. And, and, and I, I think making someone is much better than breaking them. So, so that, that's some of my feedback uh, uh, of, of good mentors along the way. Wonderful. Emily, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, of course. Um, so working in sports is is a male dominated industry, um, we, we could say working in professional sports. And um, it wasn't until I was maybe almost 10 years into my career until I had a female boss. Um, and so what I can say about this is that having allies is so important. And those allies can be male or female, um, but but making sure that you've got them is is paramount. And the, the best uh, bosses that I've had are those that gave me the space to succeed. So a little bit um, less micromanagement, a little bit more direction, and then an opportunity to do the work. Um, these bosses treated me um, equally and fairly among whatever rank that I um, was at at that time. Um, they also, in, in other words, gave me sort of equity in the workplace. I got the job and then they let me do it. Um, I think one of the most important things uh, for, for men is to not make assumptions on what a woman can or cannot do or what limitations they might have. And um, I've got an example of that. I was reminded recently um, a post on LinkedIn. This woman went and interviewed for uh, an executive position and she was um, completely qualified, had a home run interview. And at the end of the interview, the, um, the male said, well, you know, the, my only concern is that you're a mother. And what I mean by that is you have certain things that you need to do, um, certain requirements that you've got inside the home, and I'm worried that might get in the way. And he made an assumption about what she might be capable of. Needless to say, she didn't get the job, but she went on to get another very high powered position in an alternative company. And um, in that first year, traveled the globe, set sales records, and did all the wonderful things that she was planning on doing um, had she had gotten the opportunity at this other company. She is us. She is any of you. And we all deserve to not be um, made assumptions upon uh, based on our gender or whether or not we might have other responsibilities outside of the workplace. And the best bosses I've had have just looked at me as the employee and what I can do and the great work I can put in um, and didn't need to think about some of the things that might get in my way to, to success. And um, lastly, I, I recently got some, um, was asked for some tips on what men can do and um, to help elevate women in the workplace given that it's Women's History Month. And um, one of the, the tips that um, I have seen happen in real, real life is giving up your seat to speak, speak on a panel, 
um, speak in front of a group to another woman um, inside your organization and letting her share her voice. Um, and the other one was, we, this is a big month um, for women, but let's continue to celebrate, share the accomplishments of women outside of these special months and do so publicly. This should go beyond the month of March and should be something that we do all year round. Emily, that was great. Both of those were great answers to that. Thank you so much. And it's also a nice segue into the next question I wanted to ask you, where during your careers, we know that women and now more and more men go through different phases in our working lives. Through our early days as single employees, to raising children, to juggling two careers in a family, and even now elderly care, we all learn about what we might call productive hours. Those are those magical hours that often occur during shorter work days where we get just as much, if not more done in the same amount of time. So I have two questions for you. As you have progressed in your careers, have you discovered how to consistently create these productive hours? And the second part of it is, have, how have you reinvented yourselves in order to utilize these productive hours during your day? Do you want to start, Emily? Sure. Um, this, this is a big one for me. And um, it did change the more senior I grew within the companies I worked. And also as I expanded my family, my plate got more and more full and um, boundaries became ever more important. And the way that I set those boundaries is, is through the importance that I put on my calendar, um, owning my time, including time blocking to get the work done that only I can do. So, and that is the high level projects that, that are the reason I have my role to make those decisions and to push those projects forward and not be inundated with the endless requests for my time. I've noticed how easy it is uh, for my entire day to be filled and scheduled with meetings um, internally and being able to set some boundaries around that because if I don't, before I know it from eight to five, I am sitting with, with my team. And in the meantime, the work is piling up in the back that are those ever more important projects. And what I'm left with at the end of the day is exhaustion from an innumerable amount of conversations and real-time decision-making that I don't have that same mental acuity to complete the projects that really deserve my total attention. So what I've done to help counteract that is, is owning, owning my schedule, uh, time blocking. So I'll schedule an hour to work on X project and an hour to work on Y project and really take that time in that hour to be really focused and dedicated on, on getting the job done. And one of the other key elements to being able to work in this way is divorcing yourself from the constant barrage of email. So setting boundaries about your responses and your response time you can't be available to other people's agendas and, and interruptions all day long. Really, you need to, the higher level you, you get, um, I believe the more you need to train your staff that they need to be prepared. Email is not available for constant answers and interruptions that are immediate all day long. Um, so I actually schedule time in my calendar to dedicate to answering those emails, giving thoughtful replies and making sure that my response moves the project along for the person that works for me rather than just um, instantaneous replies that might not contain the information needed. Well, what's so interesting about what I hear in that is that it's that mental acuity that you're making sure you maintain and grow and keep fresh so that when you are facing and, and digging into something, you really can contribute to it. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. I mean, if I sign myself up to be a part of a meeting, I'm going to do my best to walk in prepared and have the presence that was um, that, that people wanted from me when they asked me to join. Um, and in order to do that, I've got to make the time in my calendar to 
make those preparations and um, be ready to contribute when when I show up. Uh, right. So so it's important to look forward in your calendar. Um, an exercise I've started is on Sundays. I, I set aside some time to look at my week's outlook and what are my priorities. Um, what do I need to get done? What meetings am I am I supposed to be attending? And what do I need to do to prepare? And that allows me to sort of backfill any white space in my calendar for those preparations and to complete those additional projects. So it takes an extra level of dedication, but when you do uh, put in that that time, it pays it forward because you're you're slightly less stressed and infinitely more prepared. Oh, wonderful. Well, Catherine, how about you? What have you desi designed over the years and implemented over the years to really help you with that as well? Well, just listening to Emily, I realized I could be a hell of a lot better than I am. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I think to echo Emily's comment, discipline. And, and, and I think if, you, if discipline is required, and, and, and I don't know how I'd phrase it as such, it's about having your brain engaged, about being switched on, so that you can make a decision in 15 minutes, not an hour. Uh, you know, if I think about the way I work today with two kids versus how I worked when I was sort of climbing up the ranks, I would spend hours finessing a presentation or drafting an email to my boss on a recommendation or a memo, you know, things that, that, that I just don't have the time to do now. And so what you realize is, is if your brain's engaged, you don't have to keep redrafting things. You don't have to keep rewriting things. And you also accept that nearly perfect is fine. It doesn't have to be perfect because as long as you're getting your point across, as long as you're dealing with the critical items and as long as a decision gets made to Emily's point, because when you're in a leadership role, you have to make decisions and you have to have all the information to make them, but processing it and then forming a judgment and then communicating that judgment are all much more important than what the font looks like or whether or not it's, it's perfectly presented. So I think, I think that, 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 that point around discipline and being switched on is particularly important. For me though, I have, I have a few periods in the day which are mine where I can get stuff done. And, and when it was with my daughter, she, she's always slept very well. And so for me, it was between sort of 5.30 and 7. If, if I just hadn't got stuff done through the day, at 5.30 in the morning, I could get up early and just get something done. And, and in my previous role, I was CFO, and it was often reading through disclosures before they went out because, you know, the buck stopped with me as to what our public disclosures as to whether it was right or not. So you just had to do it, but they were so dull and they're so long that you need to be able to just concentrate um, and now, because my son, who's 21 months, doesn't sleep in and is a bad sleeper, it's turned into sort of that sort of 8.30 till 10 p.m. And that that is a time where I can just, if I need to, focus, everything switched off, and I'll get what needs to be done, done. And I think having those periods and having an understanding husband and, and being able to just block those times out to deal with the priorities gives you that freedom and and the one thing with all of that is it means you have to sleep well so I'm someone that has to sleep and so the discipline again comes back to going to bed on time making sure that you're relaxed making sure that you don't let things get in your way that you don't check your emails just before you go to bed and if, if you can do that then it means you can get up at 5 30 or it means you can do that work and you're not so exhausted that you can't concentrate so so it echoes a lot of the things that emily said but i i don't have as good as boundaries as you have emily so I, i'm gonna have to learn from what you said because i do i am the person that will respond to an email as soon as i get it and i shouldn't do that i i should actually focus more and set those boundaries we're all a work in progress. <laughs> Some things are better than others. <laughs> Wonderful. So what I'm hearing is really kind of three major themes. One is that this discipline has to be in place, that that's where we find that productivity is making sure that we call up those feelings of discipline. That the goal is to be very present. So when we're there, we're very, very present. And also carving out time that lets us really focus and prepare so that we're able to then move forward through our day with our mind being able to move from thing to thing 
and I'm constantly working on our own discipline. And as Emily has done, illustrated so well, how to say dis stay disciplined with things like email and other things that pull us away from that. Very well done. Very, very nice. Well, the next question I wanted to ask you is, can you guys talk a little bit about a hurdle that you faced in your career that you've been able to overcome and then turn that into an asset? Because that's what I found in many women who've been successful and men as well, but especially with women to be able to take a, a hurdle and turn it into an asset. Catherine, did you want to start with this one? Sure. And it sort of links to being a woman, but it isn't directly. It, it's about being an outsider. So, so throughout my career, I've always been somewhat of an outsider. So, so when I went into finance, I went into finance as a geologist without any financial, real financial training. And so it was being able to, um, first of all, prove to those around me that just because I was a geologist, I could do the job just as well as they could. You know, the fundamentals of cash flow modeling, accounting, they're not hard. You just have to learn them. Um, so, so, but it was always this assumption that because I wasn't an economist or I wasn't a, 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 ch a chartered accountant that I somehow wasn't capable. So, but what that also meant was it gave me the advantage of looking at things very differently, not having been biased by my education. When you came into looking at investments, looking at uh, financial disclosures, you know, just dealing with these things with fresh eyes. And I think then when I moved into mining into Barrick, I came from being someone from the UK, as you can tell from my accent, into North America, first into Canada and now more so in Nevada. You'll see I, I've learned how to say it correctly. Um, uh, but uh, but being someone who who was both from the finance industry, uh, English and a woman meant, first of all, you had to overcome all of those hurdles, you know, not being local, uh, trying to understand the dynamics, the politics, the 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 the, the, the sort of cultural norms that, that you, you, you take a while to pick up on. But what it also has given me the advantage of is being able to look at it completely objectively. You know, I, you know, to me, I, whether I'm rural or urban, whether I'm Las Vegas or Washoe County, do, you know what I mean? All of these differences, all of the things that affect the way people approach the business, you know, finance versus mining versus other industries, being able to look at it in, in a much more objective context has been really powerful for me, um, both to then uh, form an opinion, but also then to communicate to others who don't necessarily understand mining or don't understand uh, the company or don't understand um, the areas that we operate in. And, and I think that's been a huge advantage. So some of it's connected to being a woman, but in general, it's more about being an outsider. Um, mm. and, and the two often combine um, because being a woman in a, in a very male dominant industry, industry automatically makes you an outsider. Right, right, very good. Emily, did you have a comment to that question? Yeah. Um, so somewhat similar, um, but I, I would say my hurdle, biggest hurdle has been the hurdle of the mistaken identity. So um, who am I and what exactly is my job um, inside of baseball? And it has been assumed to be a number of things from, uh, from secretary to merchandise manager um, to roles that people might think would be um, stereotypically filled by women, and or and it still happens to me to me today. And so the opportunity um, that exists within this hurdle is the opportunity to create visibility for women who are in leadership roles in sports. The surprise factor deteriorates the more that I am able to stand up and say I'm the general manager of the Reno Aces, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of women say. You know, what do you do when that happens? Or, you know, I was, I was leading the meeting and leading this department and somebody asked me to get coffee, you know, what, sh what should I do? Um, and so there's some actions I think that women can take. First, take a seat at the table. If you're running the meeting or invited to the meeting, take your seat. Don't wait on the sidelines for the table to fill and take the leftover one. Um, the second is the introduction. Stick your hand out there when we can, um, again, <laughs> post pandemic, or at least your business card and make that introduction of who you are and, and what you do. And then finally, don't forget to sing your own praises. I think women are 
uh, uniquely excellent at supporting their teams and talking about what great work their teams produce. And then oftentimes we forget to talk about what we did to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And so don't forget to, to talk about the work that you have personally done and the contributions that you've personally made. And uh, that, that takes confidence, but that confidence comes through practice or repetition. And um, the more you do it, the more you lead the way for the next girl. Oh, wonderful. That's great. And I think you both present kind of two sides of the coin where Catherine talked about being the outsider and what that brought to it. And what I liked, Emily, and what you said is kind of being the outsider and people not having uh, or having different expectations of you or more traditional expectations. Both of those play really important in providing a new perspective. And then also for people who work with you to understand that they need to promote that, they need to embrace that, which of course allows us to use diversity better. As diversity comes into our organizations, we can both learn how to support it and recruit it. And for people who come in as outsiders, how to promote yourselves. And then what are the great things that you bring to that organization because you can see it differently. Very nicely done, very, very good. Uh, my next question is, when we think about recruiting women into STEM-related or other non-traditional career fields like sports management, how have you personally supported women both in joining the workforces that you're in, as well as how to focus their education? Emily, did you want to start with that? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying it's been a journey for me. I didn't start out knowing how to do this or where to start or what to say. And in fact, when I got my role as GM, it came with a headline that I was the first female in nearly 20 years to have this role at the AAA level. And I initially felt that I had earned the role because of what I could do, not because of this headline. And I wasn't necessarily sure how to navigate um, from that point forward until about six months later, I was at baseball winter meetings in Las Vegas, Nevada with uh, about 300 other women who work in baseball, an incredible room. I got the chance to be on a wonderful panel similar to this one um, and talk my, tell my story and, and speak to the room. And following that conversation, I had a number of women approach me and say, wow, I didn't know that I could do that. I didn't know I could have that role until I saw you. And that's where it started to click for me that this wasn't necessarily about me or my headline. This was about creating visibility for women who are doing incredible things in this industry. And there are many. And so in this last year, um, I started a podcast. I started a podcast called Leadership is Female, where each week I interview women who have a successful career in sports. And we discuss the tips, the hurdles, uh, provide motivation and advice for women in the industry for those who are, um, who are working day in and day out. And this leans back again to that visibility piece. Week after week, we present another woman who's CEO, president, right. chief operating officer. I mean, the, the titles are endless in all different areas of professional um, sports and um, sports technology. And um, I think really, you know, it wasn't just about my voice individually, it was about our voices together. And that's, that's what I'm working on now to support uh, women in sports. Wonderful, great. Catherine, did you want to comment to that question? Uh, yeah, I don't have a podcast. I, I'm, uh, that's a good idea. Um, I, I think, so similar actually, again, to, to Emily, I, th I think the biggest value to encouraging girls, women into, into whether it's STEM related businesses or mining or any industry really is, is, is to show them examples of people that have succeeded. You know, I, I think about who my major role models are and I realize it was, first of all, it was my mother, you know, she was a working professional. And so it just seemed to me perfectly normal that that was what it was going to be. It happened to be that the prime minister at the time was a lady. So I just assumed women ran the country. And then there's also a queen of England. So, so during the 1980s and 90s, well, 1980s, for me growing up in those formative years, you know, it, it didn't seem a thing. It was just the way the world worked. And so I realized how important it is that for children and for teenagers and, and young women 
I, you know, that we talk a lot about um, the challenges, but, but what I'd rather just show is that it's just normal. You know, women have jobs and they balance things and they're successful and they can work in, in these environments and, and you can do it too. And so for, I used to be on the board uh, of Women in Mining UK. And one of the things we started to do is rather than just have group sessions where people would come and drink wine and have their handbags over their arms complaining what it was to be a woman in mining, uh, we would actually start setting up um, uh, panels to discuss topics in the mining industry. So whether it was legal issues, environmental issues, uh, countries, and what we would then do is have a mixed panel and make sure that at least half of it were women who were representing their subject matter. So they were on the panel, not because they were a woman, they were on the panel because they were a subject matter expert. Wow. But because we were women in mining, we could make sure we got the subject matter experts that were women. And, and then we also had men too, to, to, to make sure that the dynamic, and then it was open to the members who were, who were women. And what it did is it just illustrated you know, that, that these people lost their gender. Do you know what I mean? You stop being a woman, you start being an expert. And, and, and that's very important to me. Throughout my career, I, I don't walk into a room thinking I'm a woman. Do you know what I mean? I walk into a room either in my old life as a fund manager or a CFO or a COO of North America because I've got a job to do. There are things need to get done. You know, it's only afterwards when I'm, I'm self-analyzing or, or, you know, feeling vulnerable that I then think, oh, is it because I was a woman or should I have done it differently? But, but at the time, it's about what I can deliver. And I think the more that we can show young women, that's all that matters or that's all that, that, that should matter. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Then that will become the reality. So, so, so very similar to what Emily was saying, it, it, it really is around setting that example and using forums wherever they're available to illustrate that you are a professional, that you are doing a job and that, and that you just happen to be a woman and to make it normal then for, for young people to want to aspire for the same thing. Well, Catherine, for young women who are still in school, do you have any recommendations in terms of how to focus their education, where they should put their interests in preparation for this? Does it matter? Is it just about engaging higher education? What is it that you uh, would suggest to them? Well, we're, well within mining, it's, you're looking for very specific um, sort of interests. So, so, and even I remember having to make a choice when I was about 16 because of the way the English system works was, was I going to follow sciences or was I going to follow the arts? You know, because, because that was the point at which you say, okay, you then go to university and you study sciences and that, and that will lead you. And I remember a very good advice being given to me by a teacher at the time, which is one, if you want to get into a good university, easier as a woman to do sciences than arts. Everyone wants to read English. And the other was, if you want to get a high paying job, um, better to do the sciences than the arts because journalists don't get paid anything. And so, so, so I'm, whether that's true necessarily quite as true given AI and all the other ch you know, challenges towards the way, the way industry is changing, I don't know, but, but it was very good advice for me. And so what we do uh, within uh, Nevada Gold Mines is really engage, first of all, at that, um, I suppose what, what, it's grade grade 10 level, I suppose, before people are really choosing what they're going to do and trying to show them what careers are available within mining. You know, that it isn't just a guy with a pick digging a rock, that, that it's very broad from, from geology, mining, engineering, through to environmental sciences, finance, commercial, legal. You know, it's just so broad nowadays. Um, so we're trying to get in before they've made a decision and then when it comes to universities, then you are targeting specific courses and being able to show, show them examples. And so what we, we do try and do, and I try and make sure that a lot of my direct reports, that they, one of their outputs for the year is actually to attend in person uh, one of these career days um, and providing scholarships. And we've just signed up with UNLV to do a business challenge so that they can use mining as a case study for one of their challenges, you know, really trying to get into the psyche of the students so that they can understand what mining is. So, so I think it's incredibly important and particularly for our industry where, where we are suffering a generation gap with a lot of 50 plus 
oh, right. and, and, and a gap between the 30 and 50 because of where the mining industry was during that period in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, where they're just, you know, commodity prices were low and it just wasn't the place people wanted to come and work. Having to overcome that generation gap and, and bring new blood into the industry is, is, is a real challenge for us. Great, Catherine. And Emily, from your perspective, in terms of sports management, is there any component to education that you emphasize to people that you're talking, especially young women that you're talking to? Yeah, I mean, my degree is in advertising. I don't have a sports management degree, but a lot of my day to day is thinking about um, the marketing of of our team. Um, so my my best advice is to start getting experience. You just have to start as as um, soon as you're old enough to work. There are jobs available. Um, you can work at a at a um, sports facility or a ballpark as a ticket taker. You could work in the team store. You can work um, in concessions. There's so many places to get started. And then as you start to say like, oh, I really, I wonder what that person is doing or what are they working on? Like you're starting to get visibility of maybe how the business might run. And then you can start to identify the areas um, that you want to pursue an internship um, or maybe a paid seasonal position, but you just have to get going. And I can't underestimate how it, how valuable every experience is. I make it a point to take tickets at the gate several times a season because I get to say hello and welcome our fans and say thank you as they come into the ballpark. I get to see what they're wearing. Are they wearing Aces gear? Are they wearing Diamondbacks gear? Are they supporting the other team? Who did they come with? Um, what are they bringing with them? You know, those types of things that are, that's information for our business to make decisions in the future. You don't get it unless you're doing that one-to-one. -one. And so thinking back to if you're 16 years old and you start out with, with eyes wide open, um, getting that experience, you're going to be much more prepared um, by the time you hit college and understand what you want to study and what areas that you want to pursue in the industry. Oh, great. Wonderful. Wonderful answers from both of you. Well, I think I have time for one more question. What I'd ask is, what advice would you like to give to our audience regarding both the value of recruiting women and what the audience can personally do to support this recruitment. I know we've touched on it a little bit during this conversation, but I'd like to call it out and end with it because I think both of you have such powerful statements to, to talk, have powerful things to say about this. Uh, Catherine, would you like to start? Yeah, well, I think, I think there's a phrase, diversity of thought. And I think that is the most valuable thing that having not only women but a more diverse workforce brings to a business and we've talked about perspectives we've talked about um how, how we look at our businesses differently but but i think that's it when when you think about the real problems businesses and industries head into it's when there's too much group think too many like-minded people looking at things exactly the same way and not realizing that the world has changed not realizing that things are moving on and, and so from my perspective, you know, having women in the workforce creates a much broader perspective than not having women in the workforce, which will add value. I think the other thing, which is a bit more uh, sort of specific, is around the dynamic that's created by having women in the room. So, so I often witness what I would see as, as competitive behavior amongst some of my male colleagues because they're asserting themselves against one another and there's much more friction and tension. Put a woman in that dynamic and that tension immediately dissipates. The way in which people interact, um, the, the level of ego involved for whatever reason, and, mm -hmm. and, and it depends on the woman, so I'm, I'm stereotyping hugely, but on the whole, what, what I see is that when women are part of a team, or women are part of a conversation or part of a meeting, it's a very different and often much more productive meeting than when women aren't in there. Um, and you deal with things, you talk about the stuff that no one wants to talk about. Uh, you're able to criticize without it getting personal. You know, that there's just a whole different dynamic that comes from having a woman in the room 
uh, than than when there isn't. So 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 that that's a bit more specific and based upon my personal experience. But but I think it it, it is equally as important as that broader view of of diversity of thought. And when you talk to people about this, what is your recommendation for them to do to support this kind of environment? I, uh, well, I think um, from my perspective, it is never to, and actually Emily brought this up, it is about not prejudging what a woman can or can't do. Okay. Uh, and I think that was an incredibly important point, which is let, let, let the individual make the decision. You know, if they've applied for a role, if, if they're interested in it, or if you have an opportunity or a project, you know, the, the difference with, I think, is that you, you must let women do something their own way. So we talked about how, you know, FaceTime and hours and how you need to be productive because, yes, we will have other commitments, but so too may men. You never know what's going on behind the scenes. And so I think, I think the, 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 the advice I would give on how you can um, really support that recruitment is essentially to provide exactly the same opportunities and offer the same um, uh, roles, whatever it is, and, and just see what happens rather than prejudge or assume you know better and who, what, that, what fits the mold. Uh, uh, that would be my, uh, you know, keep an open mind. That would be my, uh, my advice on that. Oh, thank you, Catherine. Well, Emily, how, what do you think, kind of building on what Catherine just talked about regarding your perspectives on letting women be? Yeah, so I actually, I took some notes on this question when you'd sent it over ahead of time and I wrote the word groupthink, um, same as Catherine had referenced. And I had happened to have um, a study on my desk um, that I had highlighted uh, the data to support diversity in the workplace and, and what that can bring to a team. And so here are these two really important points that we can take home today, a study uh, by McKinsey found that companies with gender and or culturally diverse executive teams were 21% to 35% more likely to outperform the competition. Mm -hmm. Additionally, another study showed that diverse teams made superior decisions up to 87% of the time, twice as fast with half the meetings. Wow. And I just think that that statistic really points back to the to what Catherine had said about um, that diverse representation around the boardroom table and what that would bring to the team. I mean, the proof is literally in the numbers. Wonderful. What a great ending to this, to grab onto this last piece of it and share it. Great data to provide. And it was wonderful talking to both of you. What a delight. Uh, Christina is there anything else I need to do or can I hand it back to you now? Sure, well, we do have a question that came in. And so since it looks like we have a few minutes left here, I do wanna make sure that we address that. Um, the question that was presented to us is from Courtney who asks, what do you say to women who find themselves with higher standards or requests applied to them real or perceived as opposed to others? I have been asked to do things twice or overprove my results, both in school and work. Um, scrolling. <laughs> that was not applied to others in a male dominated environment, even when I knew my work was good. Well, I, I, I can start and uh, I'll let it let Emily go. So 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 I, I would just embrace it would be my answer to that, which is, I think, you know, whether, whether, whether perceived or real, I, I think women do have to work harder to prove, um, to prove that, that we are as good as, because, because ultimately we're, we're starting, um, uh, we're starting, I don't know what the phrase is, but starting a step behind, uh, given, given the society we're in. But, but what that does is it, it gives you a, um, a work ethic, uh, a focus, um, uh, almost a perfectionism, which as long as it's used productively is very helpful, that, that most male colleagues don't have. And so if you harness that and embrace it, then it actually helps you be much more successful in the future. 
Um, uh, so, so, so yes, it may not be fair, but you can fight about, you can cry about things being fair forever. Um, but if you actually recognize the value that that creates in, in making sure that the product you give, that the, the sense checking that's gone behind it means that it is always going to be better than, than the average or that the, than your colleagues, then, then ultimately it, it, it makes you a, a, a more productive and, and a better, uh, making a bigger difference in the workplace and, and find a job where you actually have an impact, then you're impacting both your environment, the world, uh, the, the business you're in. So, so that would be my, my sort of positive skew on, on that frustrating issue. Yeah. And I would, would echo that there's a saying, um, a little uncouth, but it's embrace the suck. So embrace it, do it, improve and be so good they won't forget you. I mean, at the end of the day, like your work is going to speak for itself. And if you can produce that superior work, that's what's going to be your legacy moving forward. And so if it turns out that this place that you're working for is not the best fit for you in the long term, it's okay to leave. And you have this body of work that you've done that can propel you to your next opportunity. So I think it's twofold. First, give it your best effort, do the work. And if it comes to a point where you can no longer do it, life's too short to be miserable, find a place that's going to value you more and, and go there. Um, but make sure that before you throw in the towel, you really give it your all so that you have that body of work to speak to your contributions. And I would just add to that, that there are others watching, you know, it may be your boss that is asking for repeated work um, or to prove yourself, but that's not the only person that's taking notice. Um, so be proud of what you're putting out there, even if you're, you're doing it more than once. Um, so we have another question. Um, a couple of people have asked if you could repeat, Emily, the name of the report that you shared where you pulled your data from. Sure, um, so it's an article um, by the Corn Ferry Institute and it's called The Next Gen Chief Diversity Officer, an Evolving Profile of High Impact d &I Executives. And I don't have a link to it. I have a printed copy on my okay. desk. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. Well, to those who are asking, yes, we will be sharing this recording. Um, so it will be available via our website. We will share it in our monthly newsletter um, that comes out in April. And then we can always, if you don't see it in one of those two places, you will always be able to request it from um, our staff here. So I want to greatly, deeply thank our guests with us today. And um, this has just been a personal favorite of our topics. And um, we will have our next hard hat chat on April 29th. And that will be covering corporate social responsibility. So I hope that the three of you will tune in with us and join us for that when we air that one. Um, but if we have any other final uh, statements, please feel free to do so. But I am just so appreciative of your time with us here today. And on behalf of our Mining Association members, thank you. Thank you, it was such a pleasure. Absolutely. And thank you, Christina, for putting it all together and encouraging us to do, to ask these questions and answer them. Yeah, and, and from my side, thank you. And I'd also just like to say, you know, it's not just your audience. I think even for me, you know, hearing other, well, hearing Emily's story, speaking to Susan, even meeting you, Christina, in person, you know, the more, the more we do this, and, and to Emily's point, not just in the month of March, the more it will be normal and the more we can all feel like we're not alone or not isolated and that everyone is, you know, I, I just do, do, can't, can't emphasize the importance of these kind of conversations.